Hello, students. We're back again with module lecture three on neocolonialism. You may notice that I've changed um, the title of this lecture from what was on your syllabus prior. Um, that's the only thing that has changed in case you were um, concerned about that. Um, but today we're going to continue our discussion of American expansionism into Latin America with a discussion of the War of 1898, the Panama Canal construction, um, and our infamous banana republics. So first, let's define neocolonialism. So neocolonialism is an informal type of, quote, colonization, where a nation exerts overwhelming economic and cultural influence on another. Um, they may intervene militarily in another nation's affairs, but that's not necessarily um, the defining feature of neocolonialism. Um, the neocolonial period in Latin America is defined as a period lasting from 1880 to 1930. Um, and while the Europeans are still involved in exerting influence over Latin America, this is a period in time in which the United States fully comes to claim Latin America as its backyard. So from in the late 1800s through the 1930s, there's some changes in US attitudes towards Latin America. So in the late 1880s, the United States is beginning to really increase its rate of industrialization and it's facing competition in the international market from European powers. So the United States is starting to look for um, access to raw materials, um, to produce its manufactured goods, but also new markets in which to sell manufactured goods. And with the Europeans taking um, control of colonies in Africa and Asia, um, the United States turns to Latin America, which I've mentioned this word already, it becomes to view as its backyard, meaning it is part of the United States. Um, it is its um, domain in which to interfere. Um, and in the same time period as the United States is looking at Latin America as its backyard, the Latin American leaders are becoming increasingly um, alarmed by the expansionist nature of the Colossus to the North, um, a name that it gives to the United States. In 1890, the U.S. Census Bureau declared the Western frontier officially closed. Um, what that means is that basically there was enough settlement all the way to the Pacific coast that the U.S. Census Bureau was like, we can no longer call this frontier, it's settled territory. In reaction, a famous historian, Frederick Jackson Turner, proposes what's known as the frontier thesis which is that all of American greatness, this exceptionalism um, that is the American spirit um, is due to its expansion and civilization of its civilization westward into these lands um, that were empty of civilization or you know, full of indigenous savages, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, Jackson is going to argue that the closing of the frontier could have devastating effects um, on internal peace in the United States, but also on the American psyche. And he actually proposes that the United States should continue its expansion of its frontier overseas. Some other ideas that are very um, popular at this time is the idea of American exceptionalism, which is the idea that the United States just has superior political and economic systems as well as cultural values to other peoples. Um, others in the United States are going to argue that the US must achieve some military victories um, in order to be considered great. And the US is going to buy into the idea of the white man's burden, which comes from um, a poem by Rudyard Kipling in which the British poet urges the United States to civilize the people of the Philippines after defeating the Spanish um, in the War of 1898, which we will discuss more 
um, coming up here. So let's talk about this war, the War of 1898. And as you can see here, a major contention in the recent scholarship has been challenging the idea of the Spanish-American War um, and recognizing it as a Cuban struggle for independence in which the United States intervened. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about how this war came to be. And I want you to be thinking about what kind of the best way it is to view um, this war. Okay. So as we've discussed, US policymakers aren't very um, optimistic about the ability of the largely mixed race Latin American peoples to govern themselves. And they par they particularly see Cuba, which is 90 miles off the coast of Florida, as a huge security threat. Um, they didn't want a majority Black nation um, that close to the United States. Rem remember the reaction to the Haitian Revolution. Um, and they also don't want to risk um, European powers gaining influence or recolonizing. So prior to the Civil War, there was actually a lot of discussion of trying to annex Cuba or purchase Cuba from Spain. Um, this never happens. The slaveholding states in the South really want to annex Cuba as another slaveholding state. Um, Northern free soil states are not interested in annexing another slave state. Um, and as you can see in this political cartoon, um, Cuba is like a rife, is like a ripe pear, um, ready to just kind of fall into the U.S.'s hands from Spain. Um, this is kind of the idea that's circulating at the time. Now in 1895, the Venezuelan situation breaks out. Um, there's a dispute between the British over in Venezuela over the border between Venezuela and British Guyana. Um, and Grover Cleveland decides to step up the tenets of the Monroe Doctrine um, by claiming that the U.S. is sovereign in the Western Hemisphere, meaning that the United States should be involved in the arbitration um, between Venezuela and Great Britain. So the British actually agree to this. Um, and the Venezuelans are not involved at all. So as you can see here, um, Grover Cleveland is depicted as um, protecting Latin America from the British lion. Um, and above what you can see is Uncle Sam um, cheering with the British um, over this agreement that they made on behalf of Venezuela without the input of the Venezuelan people. So the United States is already stepping up by 1895, its participation in be dominating, you know, expressing its hegemony in the, in the hemisphere. And that's when the Cuban War for Independence breaks out. So in 1895, the fighting for Cuban independence begins again. Um, and the Spanish send General Valeriano Whaler to Cuba to crush the insurgency. Now, General Whaler is one of the premier um, kind of military minds behind counterinsurgency. And one of his um, strategies is to kind of remove civilians from the theater of conflict so that anyone left in the theater of conflict must be a combatant. Um, and so what Whaler did was they had the Spanish build internment camps on the island and he placed the Cuban people, moved the Cuban people from the countryside into these internment camps where more than 100,000 of them died from disease and neglect. Here's a, um, here's a photo of a mass grave um, that was uncovered at one of these um, camps. Uh, this um, is played up in the U.S. media as the Cuban Holocaust, although as you can see from all of this human bones in this picture that it's probably a pretty decent um, descriptor of the event. Um, 
So U.S. papers, like I say, they pick up on um, General Whaler's um, kind of atrocities. Um, and as you can see in these political cartoons, you've got the Cuban people frying to death over um, on a pan of Spanish misrule over anarchy. Um, this is called yellow journalism, and this becomes very popular in this time period. Um, I think that uh, we can all understand, um, living in our current air, um, kind of media climate, what yellow journalism really is. It's, it's news um, reports that are at least sensational and, and may even be outright fictitious, um, but they're meant to stimulate the emotion of the reader um, and increase profits for the paper. So think about like, say the Facebook and YouTube algorithms that are supposed to um, bring you videos and posts that make you angry. This is the sort of thing that we're talking about here. So the next big event and the event that actually leads Congress to declare war on Spain comes in January of 1898 when um, President McKinley sends the USS Maine battleship to anchor in Havana Harbor to kind of keep an eye on the Spanish and all of the horrible atrocities they're commi committing on, on Cuban territory. Um, but a few weeks later, the USS Maine explodes and sinks. Of course, the United States blames Spain and Congress immediately declares war um, in April of 1898. The question of whether or not to allow Cuba to actually win its independence remains salient during the the debate over the declaration of war, Congress decides that they are not going to annex Cuba and po popular opinion in the United States was not for annexation, it was for Cuba Libre, the, the idea of a free Cuba. And so Congress attaches this amendment to the declaration of war called the Teller Amendment. It honors the prior no transfer agreement with Spain that the United States um, would not colonize any of its former territories. Um, so it confirms the US policy of support for an independent Cuba. Um, this is how Cuba um, doesn't get annexed while the United States would go on at the end of the War of 1898 to annex former Spanish territories of Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and Guam. So here you can see Cuba's got this sort of um, special um, position in this cartoon where he's waving a flag of independence. Puerto Rico is dressed as Uncle Sam, so it's supposed to be in a little bit darker, so at like, a, like he's copying the Americans. And then the, we'll talk a little bit maybe more about how the U.S. views the Philippines. It's not really within our... Um, our uh, purview for this class, but as you can see, the Filipino is the darkest of the characters and also dressed um, as, a, as a savage, um, which kind of shows you the, which kind of gives you some insight into kind of the hierarchy of civilization that the US is willing to bestow um, upon these territories. Despite the Teller Amendment, U.S. policymakers still do not believe that Cuba can be independent. So, for instance, the U.S. Secretary of State, Henry Clay, will say, quote, the population itself is incompetent at present from its composition and amount to maintain self-government, end quote. What does he mean there? There aren't enough white people and there are too many black people. That's what he means. <laughs> Um, and then McKinley's ambassador to Spain says, quote, Cuban independence is absolutely impossible as a permanent solution to the difficulty, since independence can only result in a continuous war of the races. And this means that independence in Cuba must be a second Santo Domingo, 
Santo Domingo is a reference to Haiti and the successful slave rebellion that freed the Haitians from French rule. They're really trying to avoid this here in, in Cuba. Um, so as you can see here, um, this Cuban um, is actually much darker um, with a little slice of, of independence pie. Can't have the whole independence pie, but gets more than the Philippines. Why? Because of the Teller Amendments. Remember that. So how does the U.S. deal with its fear of an independent Cuba, but it's, a, it's kind of, it's, wow, my brain is losing the word. Um, it's commitment to honor an independent Cuba at the end of the war. Well, that's where the Platt Amendment comes in. So when the hostilities end mere weeks after the U.S. enters, um, the fighting in Cuba, the U.S. remains and sends more military onto the island of Cuba in order to pacify, excuse me, the island. And pacification required the Cuban government to attach the Platt Amendment to its constitution in order for the U.S. to agree to withdraw its troops. The Major provisions in the Platt Amendment pre really prevent Cuba from having its own independent foreign policy and give the U.S. access to military base, bases such as Guantanamo Bay. And so this is where we, ha where we gain access um, to Guantanamo and um, whether or not we should um, have Guantanamo open remains a, a pretty heated debate among uh, U.S. policy, uh, within U.S. policy circles today. So should we call this the Spanish-American War? That's what it's been referred to in historiography for a very long time. Um, I am more of a fan of the War of 19 1898. Um, because calling it the Spanish-American War completely denies the Cubans' role in their own independence. Um, according to the U.S. version of events in Cuba, anyways, the U.S. defeats Spain in just 10 weeks without help from the Cubans, but it gains possession of Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and Guam. The outcome of this war is really that the United States becomes a military and economic power beyond its own, um, beyond its own shores. So the Platt Amendment is going to lay the foundation for U.S. intervention in Cuba, and it's going to feed the resentment in Cuba against the United States that will help fuel the 1959 Cuban Revolution. We'll talk about that more when we get to the Cold War. Um, these new possessions become U.S. Mil strategic military bases that um, are very, very helpful, particularly the Philippines and Guam um, with the war against Japan in World War II. Um, and then over the next 30 years, um, the U.S. is going to embark on a pattern of intervention and interference in the Latin American region as a whole that's going to breed resentment against the United States. And here is a political cartoon about the Platt Amendment. So here you have a pill on a spoon named that's um, labeled Platt. And this man's hat says Pueblo Cubano, so the Cuban people. The Cuban people are being asked to swallow the Platt pill, which they call La Pila Dora Amarga, which is a net, like the sour pill, the gross pill. Um, so it's a pill that the Cuban people are forced to swallow. Now, with these strategic military bases, the United States turns its focus to increasing transportation and trade. And the idea for building a transoceanic canal through Central America had been percolating among the European powers in the United States for decades. So in 1901, President Theodore Roosevelt becomes president. He was um, famous for having served as a 
member of our Rough Riders, of the Rough Riders. He was an all volunteer um, cavalry unit um, that actually helped fight in the war of 1898. Um, he's a staunch advocate of expansionism and probably his primary goal of his presidency is to get um, U.S. control over um, a transoceanic canal that cuts across Central America. So now I'd like for us to enjoy this short video that does um, a much better and much more entertaining job of explaining um, the construction of the Panama Canal. So if we could take a few minutes just to watch this. You have three options, across the country by mule, sail around Cape Horn, or a boat to Panama, trek through the jungle, and hop on another boat the other side. All going well, you'll be at Disneyland within two months. But the Panama trek was incredibly deadly, so using Irish and Chinese labourers, the Panama Railroad was built. Half a million people travelled it in the first ten years. It became a major artery for the US Postal Service, and was soon the highest priced stock on the New York Exchange. Transcontinental travel was big business. 50 miles of land was the only thing stopping the Atlantic from meeting the Pacific, and all the trade, politics, and power that came with it. After completing the Suez Canal, Ferdinand de Lesseps returned to Europe a hero. He had brought India 6,000 miles closer and made Africa an island. 30,000 people came out to congratulate the Frenchman in London. His reception in Paris was one of royalty. His new friends included Jules Verne, Victor Hugo and Gustav Eiffel. So when he announced his next project was to cut through Central America, few people doubted him. The Americans had already done surveys of the area and were convinced of a lock system at Nicaragua. However, de Lesseps was set on a sea level canal at Panama. It was the shortest route and that's all that mattered. But Panama had mountains, rivers, jungles, volcanic rock, a continental divide, malaria, yellow fever, jaguars, snakes, and was still technically a region of Colombia. Rudin de Lipinay, the French engineer, pointed out that Suez had been easy for the Lesseps because it was a flat desert. Rerouting the Chagas River in Panama would be an impossible task. He suggested bridging the land with artificial lakes and rocks. Everyone laughed. The all respected the Lesseps had spoken. It would be at sea level. An international conference was held to decide the final route. Everyone, but the few engineers who had actually been to Panama, voted with de Lesseps. A French company was set up, they bought the railroad and agreed to give Colombia 5% of any revenue. Using Caribbean and Indian workers, the jungle began to be chopped back in 1881. Annual rainfall in Panama could be three meters. Soon the monumental scale of the task became apparent. Mudslides meant any progress would be undone after the next big storm. To stop the canal walls from sliding in, a new slope of one to four had to be cut, doubling the amount of excavation. At the highest point along the canal, the new width would have to be three quarters of a mile. Labourers were armed with nothing but a machete and a pickaxe. The death toll was at times 40 a day. Yellow fever and malaria spread like wildfire in the swampy, inhumane conditions. Bodies of black workers were often just rolled from where they died into the dumping grounds. People spoke of ghost ships arriving from the Caribbean, the crew dead even before reaching Panama. In 1889, the French company went bankrupt and work came to a halt. 800,000 investors lost their money and 23,000 people their lives. The canal sat untouched until Theodore Roosevelt was elected a decade later. He was convinced the US Navy needed quick access to the Pacific Ocean and a canal would be the only way. So the Panama versus Nicaragua debate resurfaced, Panama winning again. Though if it hadn't been for the French attempt, it's likely the canal today would be at Nicaragua. But a lot of the work was already started and the young, ambitious America couldn't resist in succeeding where the mighty French empire had failed. The slight problem was that Panama was a region of and owned by Colombia, but the US refused to sign any treaty where they didn't have complete sovereignty over the canal zone, and Colombia weren't willing to give that up. In 1903, Colombia was in political unrest, so the US turned to Panama directly. Psst, Panama, do you want to be a new country? If you were to have a revolution, we wouldn't not protect you with our massive warships. Yeah, sure. And Panama signed a treaty giving America total control over the canal once they became independent. A lot of people weren't happy with the US intervention of Panama, so Roosevelt asked Eternal General Knox to form a legal defence. Ah, Mr. President, do not let so great an achievement suffer from any taint of legality. In 1904, work began. The US plan by Joseph Ripley and Alfred Noble would be an adaptation of Delipanese from 25 years earlier. 
thick series of locks on either ocean to raise ships 26 meters above sea level and then dam the Chagas River to flood huge areas of central Panama. 164 square miles of jungle, town and railroad would be lost underwater, creating Gatun Lake. The Chagres River, so difficult an obstacle for a sea level passage, would become the lifeline of the Lock Canal, feeding it with a constant water supply. Yet the engineering required would still be immense. The Calabra Mountains must still be cut through, Gatun Dam would have to be one of the largest in the world, as would the locks themselves. Roosevelt himself visited in 1906, becoming the first president to leave the country while in office. Not resigned to pickaxe and shovel, the Americans brought dynamite with them. The project became not one of digging, but of earth removal, and this meant miles and miles of continuously moving railroads. Healthcare, accommodation and food were all provided for. Government-run hotels and shops were making a steady profit while subsidising the expenses of canal workers. Papers back home warned of the political threat these people would be when they returned. Americans, who had thrived under socialism, but if you'd gone to Panama looking for a socialist utopia, you'd have been disappointed. There was no shared ownership or democracy in action, and you'd better have been white, because segregation still existed in all walks of life. An estimated 200,000 people migrated from the Caribbean, making up the vast majority of the workforce. Black workers were given appalling food and accommodation, if any at all. Single men often lived in converted boxcars along the canal line, and families were forced to fend for themselves in Cologne, Panama City, or the jungle. Despite all the medical and safety advancements made, a black worker was four times more likely to die than a white worker, being struck by falling rock, caught in machinery, or blown apart by dynamite. 33 years, 118 million cubic metres of earth, a new country, and 27,000 lives later, the canal was finished. Its completion bookmarked the end of a global era. On August the 3rd, 1914, the Cristobal made the first ocean-to-ocean -ocean crossing. But there was no fanfare or celebration in Panama. As night fell that same day, half a now slightly smaller world away, Germany declared war on France. Trade, politics and power would never be the same again. In the coming years, it became a lifeline of global travel. 5% of all world trade passes through the canal. Its political and financial importance became hard to overestimate. Tensions between the US and Panama continued to rise. Panamanians believed that control of the canal was rightfully theirs. After the US pressured the UK and France to give up their claim to Suez, many in Panama saw this as hypocritical. There were riots and deaths throughout the 60s, building international pressure on the US. In 1977, Jimmy Carter signed a treaty granting Panama future ownership and control of the canal, as long as it remained a neutral waterway. Your own strong feelings about the Panama Canal Treaty of 1903, drafted in a world so different from ours today, has become an obstacle to better relations with Latin America. After a quick US invasion in 89 to overthrow General Noriega, the Panama Canal officially became the property of Panama on the last day of the 20th century. But by then it started to become more economical to build ships larger than the canal and start sailing around Cape Horn again. In 2007, Panama began expansion of their canal. Two new sets of locks were built parallel to the old ones, increasing the maximum size and capacity. The expansion itself was a massive project, taking almost as long as the Americans did. So the issue of who built the canal is complicated. It was the US that built the railroads with Irish and Chinese workers. The French excavated 50 million cubic meters of rock with Indians and Jamaicans. The US finished the project using Caribbean and Central American workers. Yet most of the canal you actually see today was built by Panamanians. Yet it would be remembered as the achievement of a single president, while actually completed under several others, all while standing on the shoulders of other nations. Human progress requires scale and ambition that exceeds generations, not just terms of office. This canal and later projects were built by many people and nations working together across continents and sometimes centuries. Human Interests now has a Patreon page. At the moment, I can only put out a video every few months as I have to fit the channel around my job. But with your help, I'd love to make them a more regular thing. Check out the video. All right, we don't need to listen to his Patreon page. It's 1850. And finally, in 1905, Teddy Roosevelt adds his own two cents to the Monroe Doctrine. It's known as the Roosevelt Corollary. Declares that the United States has the right to act as an international police force in the Western Hemisphere in the interest, interest of order, stability, and prosperity. Um, the U.S. would intervene in Latin American countries to prevent Europeans from invading to collect debts. Um, 
the Roosevelt Corollary is going to inspire a bunch of interventions, um, including one in the Dominican Republic. These interventions are going to be known as gunboat diplomacy. And this gunboat diplomacy, um, as you can see here, you have the US ship with the Monroe Doctrine flag on the barrel telling the British to get back um, away from Santo Domingo um, with their debt claims. So it's just kind of an illustration of what I'm talking about. And then the banana republics. So we're gonna talk about United Fruit Company and dollar diplomacy in the Caribbean. So the neocolonial period um, in Latin America corresponds with what's known as the region's great export boom. Um, this, so during these decades, Latin American nations are greatly increasing um, their export of raw materials. Um, they are using private loans as well as the revenues from those um, exports to increase the um, miles of railroad track and other infrastructure um, in their nations just to increase the export of primary goods. Um, so US businesses are going to come to own critical infrastructure and vast amounts of arable land in Latin America, which is going to make them, um, these US businessmen powerful in Latin American national politics. So Banana Republic is a colloquialism um, that comes to describe the imperial domination of these small Latin American nations whose economies relied on the export of primary resources by the United States and its corporations. Um, so we're mostly talking about bananas here, but this that the term Banana Republic can also be applied to countries that um, say in Cuba, it wasn't bananas, but it was sugar. So it's, it's kind of just one primary export. It could be a mineral um, or, or something of that nature. So the origins of United Fruit Company um, come from the 1870s um, where US businessman, Minor Keith inherits and completes Costa Rica's railroad project. not Costa Rica, it's um, Guatemala. I don't know why I have that written incorrectly. So it's Guatemala, um, finishes Guatemala's uh, railroad project. Um, and because it was such an expensive project and because he incurred so many costs and the Guatemalan government couldn't pay, um, they gave him control of the railroad itself and also a 99 year lease of land along both sides of the track. So kind of like the Panama Canal Zone where the US has land on both sides. Um, so he decides he's gonna start planting bananas and using the railroad that he owns to export these bananas. He starts becoming very successful. And in 1898, he merges with another company to become the United Fruit Company. Um, and at its height, as you can see here, these are kind of all of the banana plantations around the region. Um, the United Fruit Company uh, is going to control um, good amounts of about a dozen of Central, these Central American and Caribbean nations. So that's something to definitely keep in mind. So like other multinational corporations, um, so we're gonna like Ford builds his rubber factory in Fordlandia um, in Brazil. Um, the workers are going to live in company towns. Um, these company towns are segregated between Latin Americans and American overseers. Um, the workers are often enslaved by debt peonage and forced to work with dangerous chemicals and suffer intense labor repression. Um, the UFC is very influential in politics, um, often working alongside the US government, um, including parts of the military and the CIA to influence outcomes. Um, and the UFC has been the source of literary in inspiration in both the US and Latin America. Um, o. Henry, who actually coined the term banana republics, um, Pablo Neruda, a very famous Chilean poet, and Gabriel Garcia Marquez, a very famous Colombian um, novelist and journalist, all reference the company in their work. All right.
let's go over some of this week's assignments. I think your key concept quiz is pretty self-explanatory. Um, this week's short answer quiz is um, from a book by Dr. Greg Grandin. Um, he is a history professor at Yale. He has a different writing style in this selection than in some of his other academic writing. So it can get a little like convoluted and confusing. I would suggest trying to take each concept as he draws it as a thread throughout the excerpt and kind of list those concepts separately um, as you're taking those your notes. That will kind of help you um, catch some of the um, questions you may have uh, about any, catch the information for the, to answer the questions I've asked you. Please, please, please let me know um, if you're struggling with the material. I'm here to help. Um, the excerpts that you're reading is going to explain the Turner thesis and those intermestic politics that help launch um, the American expansionism overseas into Latin America, um, beginning really with the War of 1898. Next would be your module activity three. You'll be watching a film called Banana Split. Um, which actually discusses the global banana market and links banana consumers um, kind of in the US and Canada uh, with the lives of banana plantation workers in Honduras. Um, so pay attention to which theory of international relations you think the film best um, exhibits. And also um, pay attention to kind of the legacies of the neocolonial period um, in the Banana Republic, kind of in these relationships between consumers in North America and producers in, in South America, okay? And then for your secondary source analysis, um, assignment two, the chapter, um, I've got a few hits, tips for you. Be sure to differentiate between the primary topic of the chapter, which is going to be a bit more vague and the main thesis or argument that's gonna be more specific. Um, I want you to be as specific as possible about when you state the topic and the argument. So for instance, tell me who, what group or organization is the topic discussing? Then tell me what, what about this group or organization is being studied in this chapter? where, what is or are the geographical locations that are being discussed? And is it one location or are we talking about locations across multiple countries, multiple sites? When, what's the time period of study? And try to be as specific as possible about this. The, the time period in your chapter may, may be only a subset of the time period for the entire book. So be very specific about that. And then um, why and how? Um, and these, the, this information, um, the why and how, you'll use a little bit more when we talk about the author's method and later activities. Um, but it, the why and the how will be in the thesis statement. It's going to describe some kind of cause and effect, cause and effect relationship. So be on the lookout for that. As always, if you have any questions about this assignment, please, 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 please just let me know. Um, and I hope everyone has a really great spring break and please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you need anything, okay? Thank you guys so much. Have a great day. Bye.